Welcome to Screw the Commute, the entrepreneurial podcast dedicated to getting you out of the car and into the money with your host, lifelong entrepreneur and multimillionaire, Tom Antion. Hey, everybody, it's Tom here with episode 146 of Screw the Commute podcast. I got Jane Ubell here. I've known her for a long time, and she was so sweet to help me develop my TV show that's uh, in Hollywood. Originally, it was called Seminar Scammers, and it's changed to Scam Brigade now. But, but even bigger than that, she's really a giver. She made her husband, the tennis pro, give pitiful old me a tennis lesson. <laughs> so that's even, that's even bigger sacrifice to help me out. All right. Now, I hope you didn't miss episode 145. That was one of my Monday training sessions where I went over the critical business skills needed by pretty much any business. So you want to make sure you go back and listen to that one. I got a big freebie to thank you for listening to the podcast. It's my $27 ebook, How to Automate Your Business. And just one of the tips in this ebook has saved me over 7 million keystrokes. And I also have another little gift over there I think you're going to like. It's a white paper that has to do with podcasting. So you want to check that out at screwthecommute.com slash automate free. Screwthecommute.com slash automate free. And of course, as always, all the links we have and all the great stuff Jane has will be in the show notes. Now, our podcast app's in the iTunes store. You can go to screwthecommute.com slash app where we have complete instructions to show you how to use all the fancy features so you can take us with you on the road. Now, our sponsor is, uh, it's me. Who else would it be on my podcast, right? So if you'd like somebody to hold your hand through all the things you need to know to have a successful online business, well, you came to the right place. I've been selling on the commercial internet since there was a commercial internet in 1994, and I know what I'm doing. So check out all the details. We hold your hand with a year-long program, and we have the great Internet Marketing Retreat Center where you spend an immersion weekend. There's no place else in the world you can do such a thing. And uh, we also give you a scholarship to the only licensed, dedicated Internet marketing school in the country based in Virginia Beach, but it's distance learning, so you can uh, study from anywhere in the world. So check all that out at greatinternetmarketingtraining.com, greatinternetmarketingtraining.com. All right, let's bring on the main event. Jane Ubell is an award-winning entrepreneur and former TV and film producer. Her credits include Good Morning America, I think it's Wall Street Journal TV, uh, ET, and lots of others. Now, in 2017, Jane founded, listen to this, Bedside Reading one of the most innovative author marketing programs in the world. Bedside Reading places books by the bedsides in luxury hotels and in the media. The hotel brands, listen to this, Waldorf Astoria, Mandarin Oriental, Fairmont, and many others. The goal of the company is to introduce and promote an author to new readers and build their fan base. And Uh, She believes an author's name is their brand. And when you have the best hotel brands in the world promoting an author and their book to their guests and on their social media platforms, in the media, and the book signings at the hotel, oh boy, it can elevate the author to a whole other level. Jane is happily married and lives in Connecticut. She's also an abstract painter, and I'm hoping I'm really hoping she allows us to put some of her paintings in our show notes, but I know they're in demand, and she's had art shows in New York City, Hamburg, Germany, Beverly Hills, and Stanford, Connecticut. So, Jane, are you ready to screw? I'm ready, babe. (laughs) (laughs) How you been? It's been a while. It's been a long time, and I'm actually great. I've been traveling around the world meeting authors, going to book conventions, book expos, Frankfurt, Germany, London, Vancouver, New York, California, Florida, you name it, I've, I've just been traveling. And you so think up the greatest fun. ideas. I mean, you used to be, I don't know if you still do the gift bags and all that stuff, but that was a stellar idea. 
And uh, people ever want to steal your ideas because they're so great. And people have stolen my yeah, ideas, as you both know. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so tell us more about this innovative thing. Boy, what a great idea. So tell us how it works. So let me start from the beginning. Listen to this. When I was in my 20s, probably about 22, I used to go out to the beaches out on Long Island. Actually, it was called Fire Island. And I was dating a guy during the summertime named Rick, another Rick. <laughs> another Rick. Rick yeah. Another Rick. And he was a scuba diver. So, of course, being 20-something years old, he convinced me that if I learned how to scuba dive and I got certified, we would go to St. Martin's, the Caribbean, mm -hmm. and we would scuba dive for a week. So, of course, what do I do being a 22-year-old? I went to the YMCA in New York City, and I learned how to dive, and I got certified in this disgusting, murky um, reservoir in New Jersey on October 31st. <laughs> Did it you find any dead bodies? <laughs> you know what? Almost. It was really horrible. <laughs> And so I'm ready. I'm certified. I've got, you know, the bikini. I'm ready to go. We get to St. Martin's. The, this guy opens up the door. It's this gorgeous hotel room. And he turns to me and he goes, you know, Jane, why don't we just be friends? I'm just so not interested in you. <laughs> and I was like, what? I was so devastated. I'm 22. I'm crazy about this guy. We get there. And he goes, you know what? Let's just be friends. Oh. But luckily... Right before I left, my stepmother, Marsha, had given me a book to read. It was called Cry to Heaven by Anne Rice. And literally, I took that book. I devoured every single word, every single page. And I remember thinking, while I was on that vacation, this book saved my vacation. And it, that kind of concept stayed in the back of my mind for literally 35 or 40 years. Wow. Literally, the back of my mind. And as, you know, my, my career took off and I went into different directions and I wanted to reinvent myself, reevaluate everything I was doing, I said to myself, you know, let me revisit this idea of placing a book by the bedside so that any traveler, God forbid, they're in the same situation that I'm in or they're with a terrible partner or they're alone. Or they're or in the they, Dominican Republic. Dominican is <laughs> going there anymore, I don't think. But I know. <laughs> I I always thought that a book by the side of the table, by the bedside, would be a really innovative idea. In fact, look at Gideon's Bible. Didn't right. I do a good job with that? <laughs> yeah, that was good. That was your idea. Yeah, <laughs> That was absolutely. my idea, you know, like 150 <laughs> years ago. So that's a reading really evolved. And so now what we do is we play as business books. We have uh, fiction, nonfiction, memoirs. We even have a children's program. A number of our hotels have children. Parents bring their children. Mm -hmm. So we developed something called the Bedside Reading Story Time at the Aquilina Hotel in Florida, Sunny, Sunny Isle, Isles Beach, Florida. And the Mandarin Oriental New York and the Mandarin Oriental DC and the Fairmont and a number of our other hotels have little guests as well, the younger set. So what I've been doing is we've been really, you know, sending really cute, adorable books all the way, you know, to the different hotels. In fact, Julie Chen from CBS's Big Brother, the host, is one of our authors, and she's in about 20 hotels starting actually June 1st. So that's kind of exciting. Wow. And then what we do is, as a partner to these hotels, one of their, um, so we do, we give them books for free. The authors pay us or the publishers pay us a fee we have the book shipped there. And then what happens is that the hotels are obligated to photograph our books and post them on Instagram or one of their social mm -hmm. media platforms. Right. Then what we do, we also photograph the book and then we do giveaways of our books in all of the major magazines. In fact, you know, Tom, I'm happy to do a giveaway for your audience. Absolutely. Where they can win a number, you know, four or five of our great best selling books. And I'll ship it to them for free. That would be awesome. So I'm happy Tell to do where that. where to go. So if you think about it, if you're a visitor and you go to this hotel, then, so think about this. The people going to these hotels are pretty, um, listen, the hotels are not inexpensive. Right. They're, they're like 500 to right. $1,500 a night. So who's going? If you think about who's going, these people are decision makers, they're influencers, they're VIPs, they're celebrities, and most people want their books in the hands being read by these celebrities and so and VIPs and decision makers, because even if you have a business book, 
Tom, you must know plenty of people that have business books sure. that are really, you know, done well, that look attractive, that are, that are, you know, significant and interesting. So if you pl- place a business book with a call to action inside the book, inviting that person who's picked up the book to call them for a complimentary consultation or a conversation or a workshop or a keynote speaking gig, that means that the business owner, that business book author has an opportunity that he would not have had before, he or she. And a big one too. And potentially big because Mm -hmm. it only takes one gig to come out of it. Exactly. So, you know, we have, so as my business has developed, we have 22 hotels. We are, we've been uh, written up in Forbes, in uh, Delta Sky Magazine, in Hotel Business, in, um, you know, all kinds of different magazines, you know, around the world, actually. Now, these don't have to be brand new books, right? No. Well, no, you know something, I have this feeling. This is what I think. I think that when you're an author and a book comes out, there's all this hoopla, you get all your friends to go on Amazon, you they buy the book and it becomes a bestseller for about a minute, right? Right, right. maybe. And then, and then what happens? Nothing. Well, nothing. <laughs> nothing, zero. Nobody remembers the book, nobody cares about the book, and nobody buys the book. Now, we do not sell books. What we do is we promote the author as a brand we get that author's book and the cover of that book as far out as we can go. In fact, I was, I have a three page column in Hollywood weekly. I've, I'm now a contributing writer to a far magazine. We, every weekend during the summertime, I select my favorite book to be read for the beach in the Hamptons, like mm-hmm. Southampton press, East Hampton press and so on. So it's not just placement. It's lots of media it's kind of a layered opportunity, marketing opportunity, because what I've discovered, it's not one thing that makes a bestseller. It's many things. It's like buckshot. It just goes out. You have to do, you have to play every angle. So we're a small niche um, marketing concept, but we're effective. And I'm really proud to say that we just went on retainer with Random House. Um, so Random House, Simon & Schuster and HarperCollins, and all the big players are are all all have been my clients for many years, because before bedside reading, as you know, Tom, I did the celebrity gifting, right? Business, mm-hmm. And they've always been in my programs, so they've trusted me for so eighteen years. So now, as this new program has evolved, they're so comfortable with me. There's not a question about who I am and what I do. And the thing about being an entrepreneur is that you always have to pivot. You know, you have to read the science ahead of time. You have to figure out what's working, what's not working. And even our bedside reading, we've pivoted since the beginning. You know, now we realize we have to add more media opportunities, more Instagram, more um, access to the hotels and let the hotels promote the book. We're now doing live book signings at luxurious hotels. We're now doing uh, book festivals. So we're really adding a lot of value to that author who joins us well that's that's a brilliant idea but let me take you back in the early days i mean did you have (laughs) i know you had jobs because you were a tv producer so i don't think you were a contractor there but take me back way back did your dad did your parents give you a work ethic or what i'll I'll, I'll tell you something interesting my father's an entrepreneur his Mm -hmm. father was an entrepreneur and i remember when i was 19 i went to colorado college and my dad calls me up one day and goes honey meet me in Denver. <laughs> We're going to a sporting goods trade show. Now my dad and his business partner, my dad was in the printing business for 30 years and he was really, you know, a brilliant businessman, but he started a side business called the Poncho Segura Sweet Spot. That was a tennis racket that mm. a friend of his had designed and invented that wherever you hit the ball in the middle of the racket, you would get a sweet spot. You would go ping. That's mm-hmm. beautiful sound. This is what, can you imagine? I still know the pitch. Yeah. And well, I learned that when I was 19. I'm still looking for <laughs> the, that right. pitch. It's the sweet spot. So I would work the tr- sporting good trade shows. I was 19. My dad said, you do whatever I tell you to do. You don't answer back. You just do what I say. Got it? <laughs> that was it. So I would schlep around from the different trade shows with him when I was a kid in college learning how to sell on the floor with real customers and learning how to create relationships with those people and learning how to watching my dad in action, which is always, 
you know what? You know, he can sell anything. And I think I've learned that gift of it's not about selling. It's really about offering something that people can really benefit from. So if someone does not benefit from your product, you're not selling them anything. And I don't believe in selling anything, only if they can truly, you know, and authentically benefit from it. I actually, going back to bedside reading, I turn a lot of people down because I don't like the cover of their book, because it's not good enough, because I have to visualize if Bill Gates is going into this hotel room or Richard Branson or uh, Warren Buffett, are they going to say this book is a joke or are they going to go, wow? This is interesting. So that's, you know, a high bar and I keep it that high. Does the hotel I, have a say in, in what? Yes. The, yeah. So okay. all the, all the books, what I do is I, all books are vetted first by me right. and then I pass it along to the hotels for a second round. And then they say yay or nay. Sometimes they say no. If the, you know, sometimes I have to change their minds, but most of the time they say yes. Um, the books cannot have any, you know, heavy duty sexual content right. or religious or political or violent. So, and the violence is just me. That's my own personal preference. But for the most part, you know, it's not that these books are benign. They're interesting. I mean, we have big, huge bestsellers. You know, Salman Rushdie was my first book to put in the hotel room. It was a random house book and I put, it was called, um, the Golden House, and I was able to put it into the Mandarin Oriental New York. And then I put in Kelly Corrigan's book, Tell Me More, and then Harlan Coben's book, and Fiona Davis, and all these huge, big best selling authors. And it's just continued to grow. But here's what I know, and this is how we talk about pivoting, right? So in August, it's usually a slow time in publishing because everybody goes away. So what I thought to myself, well, if everybody's going away and they're kind of like done for the year or done for the season, what am I going to do? So I decided that August was going to be my indie author month. So all these independent authors that can't get arrested, I'm now <laughs> putting them in the Hamptons. I'm putting them in my hotels and I'm making it a, you know, the bedside reading indie, indie month, you know, the month of August. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to celebrate all these independent authors. So I'm opening up the floodgates for the first time, allowing my indie authors, if it's a good qualified book, right. to go into my five-star hotels. So that's, you know what, it's pivoting all the time. When you see an opening, you just got to walk through it. All right, now let me ask and, you, are you putting your glasses in there too so they can read it easier? So it's such a great <laughs> question. And the answer is yes. Uh, I knew it. <laughs> so years ago, this is a great story. They don't know what I'm talking about, though. You know. They don't know. I'll yeah. tell you the story. So okay. years ago, um, I had a business and it was, well, let me start with the goodie bag business. So I used to be a TV producer and a movie producer. And then I started a PR firm um, in New York City. I moved back. I moved from California to New York to be with this guy that I ended up marrying, my beautiful husband, Rick. And what happened was that 9-11 came and Rick and I had just gotten married on 9-16, five days after 9-11. Oh, wow. And I had a PR firm with another woman named Jane and all of our clients, except for one, left us. They said, we don't know what's going on in New York City. Business is suspended. So I looked at my business partner and it was time for us to part anyway. So we parted. And then a friend of mine said, you know what would make someone would make a lot of money if they actually would place gift bags on the Hampton buses, the buses that go to the Hamptons from New York to uh, the Hamptons. And I said, I don't understand what you're talking about. And she explained, I went, okay. So I literally by myself walked up and down Madison Avenue, New York city. I went into these, um, you know, beautiful, gorgeous Madison Avenue stores. And I said to them, hi, my name is Jane Ubell, and I'm creating a gift bag that's going to go on the buses to the Hamptons. Do you want to join us? And every single one of them said yes. Wow. And then I said to them, well, great. So the price is $2,500, and we need 500 products. And they go, uh-oh, forget it. We can't afford $2,500. So I said, not a problem. Let's make it $1,500. They said, we can't afford $1,500. And then I said, okay, $800. And they go, yes. So 800 was the magic number that I started with, and I ended up getting 30, listen to this, this is hilarious, 30 products. I had 30 companies sending me 500 units <laughs> of products from 
skincare and hair care and books and chocolates to your house right to my house and rick and i had just moved into this house it was a small house it was in chappaqua at new york and rick the the ups driver pulls up with a pallet if anybody doesn't know what a pallet is, it's a wooden crate like stacked high with cartons and all like saran wrap so nothing falls off so the guy has a forklift has to unload it in my garage. Rick looks at me and goes, what are you doing? I go, I have no idea. <laughs> so I ended up hiring these local kids, like 12-year-old little kids on my <laughs> block. And we got these picnic tables and we had this relay. I had like 10, 12-year-olds literally packing, you know, <laughs> gift bags on my lawn, the backyard for like like hours, like six hours, like child labor. You know, it was crazy. <laughs> and they put the gift bags all over the house. And then about four or five o'clock, my husband said time to stop take a break go get your nails done you look terrible you look exhausted he would never say look terrible but he said you look exhausted so i go to the nail salon and i sit down and i just about burst into tears because i'm exhausted i don't even know how to get these bags to southampton where the bus depot is i have no idea and i'm just about to cry and this lovely young woman sits down next to me and she goes what's the matter and I, I said, I just started a business. It's called Buzz Bags. That was the original name. I've got 500 tote bags of great products sitting all over my house. And I don't know how to get it to the Southampton. And I don't know what, to, you know, I'm exhausted. And she, I said, what do you do? And she says, oh, I'm a writer for the New York Times. <laughs> Bingo. Right out of the gate. The first time I did it, I had an article in the New York Times. Oh, man. And after that article... I ended up, the gift bags were a success. I hired a man with a van. My former business partner's husband had a, he was also in the printing business and he had a man with a van. So I hired the guy for 300 bucks and he drove all the, he came to Chappaqua and drove everything out to Long Island, which was perfect. And I gave him, and it was great. And then ultimately I ended up working with an organization called ARC, which is Association for Retarded People. It's a terrible acronym, but the way it is. And they were great. So we had these developmentally challenged adults packing all the bags and then they had trucks and they would drive it out to the Hamptons. And that continued honestly for 18, 17 years. All right. Now I didn't hear you talking about negotiating, you know, you can't just go up to the bus and throw them on the bus. You had to make a deal with them. I'll tell you what happened. This is funny. So after I figured out like who was the owner of these, these buses in the Hamptons, um, everybody said to me, oh, you better be careful. The guy is terrible. He'll never call you back. He's really awful. So I decided that I was going to go drive to the Hamptons and just stalk him. And I did. <laughs> I went there. I found him and I introduced myself and, and I did some clever research on him. And I found out that he was a tennis player. So I oh, basically, perfect. you know, bribed him with my husband. I know. <laughs> I said, there you go. Works every time. So I said, oh, my God, you love tennis? My husband was a professionally ranked tennis player around the world, Wimbledon, U.S. Open, French Open. Why don't you, um, I'll have him play with you. <laughs> and then it was like, great, what do you need from me? I said, I just want to put these uh, bags on the bus. And it was not a problem. Oh, wow. And so that was really great. So you imagine the first time out, you know, I had 30 people paying me $800. You do the math. That's yeah. a pretty hefty paycheck. Then after the New York Times article came out, we started getting calls from, believe it or not, Sting's company. He, he had a, uh, it's the Rainforest Foundation called, the Central Park Conservancy called, then the uh, Billy Joel had this Broadway show on Broadway and they called. So we started doing gift bags for all these people. And then I had a partner at the time and she got us into Entrepreneur Magazine and I had a full page in entrepreneur and then entrepreneur magazine called and united airlines called so they kind of parlayed into doing gift bags for united airlines for first and business class passengers which i did for five years and that was excellent and then one day and one of one of the perks of being in business with an airline or doing being a vendor is that they get to fly you around so one day i was flying from new york to la and i had just gotten my first pair of reading glasses and of course what happens i left them at the someplace else. And everything, what happened was that they, um, I said to the flight attendant, do you have any reading glasses? And she said, no. I said, well, why not? Somebody <laughs> should sell them on an airline. I went, that should be me. <laughs> so I went to China. I got them made. I made a deal with United Airlines. And you know, I ended up also selling them on United for five years. And so 
but after five years, the third party vendor that I work with didn't pay me. And they were, they were backlogged in payments. I went, I can't, I'm too busy with my gift bag business. Cause by then we were working with the Grammy foundation and working at universal and we we're doing all these huge events in LA. Um, I ended up um, pulling my eyewear from United and then, I, of course, what happens when you have 5,000 pieces sitting in your garage? <laughs> I was that's very lucky. Actually, 18... 10,000 lenses, if you look. Right. And that's right, 10,000 lenses. And then basically, all of my, um, this is really funny, was that literally when I got the, back, the product back into my garage, I got an email from some guy who said, oh, I just saw your reading glasses on, Uni on United Airlines in the catalog. Can I sell them for you on my deal? It was like a Groupon. It was right. the beginning of the Groupons. So then I dove straight into this is how entrepreneurs have to pivot. And when an opportunity you know, presents itself, they said, we'll sell it for you. And then AT&T called and Groupon called. And I started selling my eyewear. So I had to pick up one of the most important skills, shipping. How do you yeah. ship all around the country? And I figured that out. And then, you know... It's kind of evolved, but I still have, believe it or not, I have about 50 reading glasses left. And weirdly enough, I still have a website that sells them. Weirdly enough, yesterday, somebody bought five pairs. <laughs> and I went, where did that come from? I don't even talk about it anymore. I forget that I have it. So, um, and but we do, when I first started the business and I was working with Shutters on the Beach, um, the executive actually... Um, Said, I said to her, you know, I've got these really cool reading glasses. She goes, oh, I need them. So she bought like a couple hundred pairs. And then she moved to the Fairmont in Miramar and Santa Monica. So now we're working on another deal. And then I have another huge chain, 33 hotel chain in New York. And now we're talking about doing reading glasses for them as well. So mm -hmm. the, the truth of the matter is, is that I thought the reading glasses business was gone. Apparently not. <laughs> so but you did uh, i don't want to use that pun but you did pair it with the book deal uh so no it's <laughs> it's kind of separate i just say you know the books are free for the hotels but if you want the reading glasses we do charge a fee yeah, so that, yeah right. you know, obviously <laughs> but so. you know i think that the whole thing about being an entrepreneur is that you have to really under see where there's an opening you know, entrepreneurs have a million different ideas a day. They do. That's the way our brains are wired. And what the big, the one big piece of advice is, number one, beware of shiny objects. Not all of your big ideas are shiny and fabulous. And be careful. Just focus on one thing. And I think the success of bedside reading is because I've only focused on bedside reading for what, for two years. This is August 15th will be my second year in this business. And everybody has been dangling in front of me. Oh, do this, do that, do this, do that. And I'm thinking, no, nope, focus on one thing. I'm just going to ignore all those shiny, pretty objects and other ideas. But I do keep a journal for big right, ideas. Right, of course. Because someday I'll look at it and go, you know, that wasn't such a terrible idea. Or maybe that was, what was I thinking? So, you know, as an entrepreneur, you know, I do work probably as hard, not as hard as you do, Tom, but I work pretty hard. <laughs> well, I was going to ask you, what's the typical day look like for you? So a typical day is um, I get up around 7, 7.30. Um, if I'm inspired, I'll go to the gym. Um, and then I go, I get into the office between 9 and 9.15. And then I have a team that comes in at 10. This is in your home, though, right? No, no, no. Oh, no. you went. You've got an office now. I moved to a great, a phenomenal um, office space. In fact, you know how they have in New York City and other places like uh, it's called WeWork. Yeah, yeah. Where, so I joined a company called Camaraderie in Stanford, Connecticut, where they have about twenty different uh, companies, and we all have our own offices. They gave me a warehouse area for my books, so it's worked out beautifully. So, um, and I love it because when you go in, there's like you know, there are tables and kitchen and people are milling around and there's a lot of like chatter and it's fun. And I have a friend that has an office there. So it's been really fantastic. So we have a guy next to us um, who has a cannabis business on one side of the, then I have another friend who has a public relations firm. And there's another guy who does, you know, the IT stuff. And another guy, another woman does, you know, one guy does chip witch cookies. You know, they have different kinds of companies are there. So I'm really loving being out of my home 
And I love being in an environment with other like-minded entrepreneurs. Beautiful. Now, what do you like best about working for yourself and what's the worst part? The best part about it is that I get to do what I want when I want. And um, I actually had hired somebody a little while ago and she said to me, that's not going to work. Do not do this. And I looked at her and I said, <laughs> you know what? Guess what? I am a grown up. This is my business. I get to do what I want. So the answer is no. And she was fighting me and I went, you're not, you don't get what I get. And I'm much older than you and I know what I'm doing. So this is not a good fit. So number one, you get to do what you want to do. Now, having said that, I'm totally open always to scaling the business, growing from others. And if I want to spend, you know, $1,000 getting on a plane and booking a hotel room to go to London, I don't have to ask permission. I just go do what I need to do. So the negative part is that I, right now I'm alone. I'm, so two things that I'm looking for, I might as well put it out into the universe. I'm looking to hire uh, somebody in Stanford, Connecticut that is a social media marketing person and an assistant. My wonderful assistant uh, currently, her name is Nora, and she is going to the nonprofit world and we're, she is leaving in about a month. So I'm very sad, but we wish her well. And so I'm looking for a fabulous assistant and I have other people that work for me. We have, there are three of us right now. And then on the Can other side- Can they be side remote? Of, do, do some of them- Nope. They have to nope. be in house. In the office. There's okay. so much that goes on. It's crazy. I mean, we do so many things. We do media recaps. We're doing an Instagram program for our clients. We're doing um, media postings. We're doing, I mean, some of the people, the kids that work for me, one day a week, they'll work remotely from their home, but I don't like it because things happen face to face. There's right, so much right. energy. And, you know, we love talking about different ideas. And when you work remotely, quite honestly, you're not given the full attention that you need. Got That's it. what I believe. So, and then the other thing I'm looking for, I think it's time for me to have a partner. I'm really growing. And I think that I have 22 hotels. I could have 50 hotels, but there's one of me. And I can't do everything. And even though I delegate, it's really um, about creating the relationships with the publishers, keeping them up, keeping the authors happy, keeping the publishers happy, doing book signings, book events, um, running around the country, doing, going to the book conventions. It's a lot of work and I'm exhausted. So the negative part is it's me, but I understand that I'm in the growth phase. I just understand it. Well, then all you do is you go get your nails done. Yeah, and then I know something what? will I happen. Nails, I do get my nails done. <laughs> and then you'll um, find your partner there. <laughs> I'll find, maybe you're right. That's, maybe you are right. Um, but you know what? I think that um, being an entrepreneur, I think there are a couple of things that are really important. And in the nuts and bolts of it, you have to understand money. You have to understand how to read a P&L, a profit and loss statement. You have to understand you know, money can come in, but there are always expenses and you need to be on top of it. And you also shouldn't remember, you should be the only person to sign the checks. Yep. That's for sure. You know, never delegate that to anybody else, no matter how big you are. And we're the kind of, I mean, I'm the kind of uh, person that I do. I'm very trustworthy and I trust a lot of people, but I keep my own counsel. I don't tell everybody everything. And I think that as an entrepreneur, you have to plan vacations. You have to plan how are you going to pay yourself. You have to reward yourself. And you also, if I were going to give you one really important mantra, I mean, to say you have to create something that you say to yourself every single day when you wake up, which is everybody can rephrase it, but you have to do some self-positive talk because it's very easy if you're an entrepreneur to go into a negative spiral. So the self-talk has to be, how did I get so fortunate to have such an incredible business? Even if it is not, you have to say it to yourself till it becomes true. How did I get so fortunate to have thought about this idea and now it's an international success? That's, you know, you have to self-talk. Your create your own positive mantra every single morning. Yeah, because one of the things I was going to ask you is how you stay motivated. And um, that seems like part of it right there. You know, I was saying this to my dad. My dad's going to be 88 in August. And we were talking about it. So he, he's the old school. He calls me up every day and he goes, okay, how many sales did you make today? How many books <laughs> did you make? 
And at some point, I, you know, I had gone through, not recently, maybe it was about three or four or five months ago, I'd gone through a slump where I hadn't made a sale in like a month. And I was so depressed. And I was really, you know, I'd wake up in the morning, oh, oh my God, maybe I'm in the wrong business. Maybe this is not real. Maybe this is not happening. So I made a couple of decisions. I decided that, and my dad said, you know what? Sales goes in cycles. Sometimes you're like in this fast paced up, you know, up, up, up. And sometimes it's a slump. It has nothing to do with you. It's just cyclical. That's the nature of life. And that's the nature of sales. Everybody goes through it. So if you are in, if you understand that you could ride out the times when it's slow. So and don't spend the, all your money when on the upswing. No, <laughs> yeah, be careful. Right. Save your money, save your money. So one of the things that has happened to me in my life. So in 2017, March 27th, 2017, um, my best friend, Noreen passed away. I remember. And Tom, you remember yeah. Noreen. Yeah, that was yeah terrible. So I had just finished doing an Oscar event with my celebrity gift bags. And I had gone to Mexico with my other friend, Jane. And we're in Mexico in Cabo San Lucas. And I said to her, and I said, I'm done. I cannot do these celebrity gifting events anymore. I'm done. I don't enjoy it. I'm out of here. So Noreen passes. I go to come back early from Mexico. I go to the funeral. And through the next like couple of days, I'm thinking to myself, you know, I need Noreen because I have a belief system that everybody's a spirit and an energy, that Noreen's on the other side. So, but I was wondering like month after month would go by and Noreen never visited me in my dreams. So I, one day I said to Rick, where the hell is Noreen? <laughs> I said, I need Noreen to visit me and tell me what to do. <laughs> Literally the next morning I woke up and there was a very intense, wonderful dream with Noreen and I sitting at this big oak table. She clasped my hands and I said, how can I feel your hands? You're dead. And she goes, you need to feel that I'm with you all the time. Wow. And from that moment on, I had this idea to do bedside reading. And I made a decision that was non-negotiable that Noreen was my partner from the other side. And to tell you the truth, I talked to Noreen every day, all, all you know, moments. I just talked to her constantly and I feel... It's a self-soothing thing to know that Noreen's energy is helping me from the other side. So, hey, it has to be successful because Noreen is my partner. <laughs> now, it could be delusional and people say I'm crazy. <laughs> that's okay. Well, that's people. how people are successful when they're, they're telling you you're crazy. <laughs> exactly. You know, it's fine. You know, all right, Noreen, I wake up in the morning now and I say, okay, Noreen, let's make some sales today. All right, <laughs> Noreen, let's rock. And we do. And I just have every confidence in the world that Noreen has my back. We're making sales. And the last time when I was looking for an assistant, I said, okay, Noreen, bring me the right assistant. And all of a sudden this woman, Nora, believe it or not, wow. came into my life and she was my assistant. This is the one who was leaving, right, right. but that's okay. But I went, okay, Noreen, that was cool. Nora, Noreen, get it? <laughs> that was pretty cool. So now I now I have to go back to Noreen and say, okay, Noreen, we wish Nora well, and now let's bring in another phenomenal human being to really help me grow because I need to get to another level. And perhaps Nora, as much as I love her, is not the right person. I need somebody else. I can't wait to hear the name of the next person when you. We'll see what fire. happens. I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea what's going to happen. All right, we got to take a brief sponsor break, and then when we come back, we want you to give. Uh, we call people to listen to the screwballs. Give them your parting thoughts to uh, either start a business or take their business to the next level. So, folks, people uh, back in when I got started, the people were charging fifty and a hundred thousand bucks up front to teach small business people the kind of stuff that I do sell on the internet. And, and I'm a small business advocate. And I knew many small businesses couldn't, you know, really afford that kind of upfront money. So, so I made all the gurus mad and I charge a relatively small entry fee to my program, but I also get a percentage of profits that's capped. So you're not stuck with me forever. And you get a year long training program. Uh, you've got unlimited access to me and my whole crew here. And it's really, it will save you a fortune in making mistakes and give you the positive side of the things that are working and aren't working on the internet. Plus, you get the immersion weekend at my school or, and, and also the uh, scholarship to my school, which you can either gift 
not in a gift bag, but you can gift it to somebody or, or use it yourself. So check it all out. If you really like to have the kind of business that uh, I'm talking about here, at greatinternetmarketingtraining.com. So let's get back to our superstar guest, Jane Ubell. And Jane, thanks so much for coming on. This is My very pleasure. inspiring. You know, I've known you for a long time, and I always knew that you, you came up with things that people just want to copy because uh, they, they couldn't think of. So, so what kind of parting thoughts do you have for our screwballs out there? And, oh, wait, before that, please tell them about your artwork. Please. Okay. Okay. So I am an abstract painter. And while I haven't been painting the last year or so, because I've been busy building my business, uh, you can go to Jane Ubell, U-B-E-L-L paintings.com. And you can see my artwork and, you know, we've sold, I've sold like 35 or 40 of them. They're still there. Some of them for sale. And that's kind of a passion of mine and it makes me happy and it de-stresses me. And in fact, I probably should go back to it because I need to de-stress a little bit. There so you go. So tell, tell the idea. authors out there also, uh, if they're in, interested in uh, being in an indie thing, uh, how do they go check it out? See if you're, so, they're worthy. Thank you, thank you for saying that. So it's very simple. You have to apply. And all you have to do is go to bedsidereading.com slash apply. Or right on my website, there's a button you can click that says uh, apply application pretty simple bedsidereading.com and that'll be in the show notes everybody all of all of her sites yeah you know it's funny because let me, i want to talk about parting words ready yeah there are a lot of naysayers out there but if you really have a passion for something who cares what somebody else says and you have to decide if you know you have to evaluate if your if your idea actually has legs and can be financially beneficial and it can really help people. If you're doing a business just to make money, it's not going to work. If your business, if your business idea is there to serve people and to really help others and you can make money, that's a good idea. Even if the other people have done it before, the way you're going to do it is going to be totally unique. You know, people used to say, oh, people can cop, anybody can put a book in a hotel room. Well, you know what? Number one, Gideon's Bible has been there for years. Who cares? Number two, nobody is doing it the way Bedside Reading is doing it because we have a system, a formula that has been wowing everybody. And it would be too difficult for anybody to replicate what we do because the, re the reason why I'm successful is because I've developed relationships with so many brands and so many people that when I call, they understand who they're getting, what they're getting, and there's trust there. So relationships are the number one key to success. Be kind to people. Oh, I have to tell a short story. Sure, go May for I? it. A gazillion years ago, 30 years ago, I went to a cocktail party in New York City, and I met this guy, and it was completely not my type. Yet he kept hanging out like all over me, and it was like not for me. I flew back to Los Angeles where I was living, and a couple of days later, the guy calls, and my assistant says, oh, Jane, this guy's on the phone. I went, oh, please. I didn't really want to call him back because what I knew what he was going to do was ask me out on a date, and I was not interested. However, my dad told me something really important once. He said, call every single person back because you do not know what they have to say, what's in their mind. You don't know. So I said, okay, he's in New York. I'm in LA. I'll call him at eight o'clock uh, LA time. It's 11 PM Eastern time <laughs> and he won't be there. So I'll just leave a message and I'll be done with this call. Well, what happens? I call him. And of course, what happens? He picks it up. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, hey, Stuart, how are you? Uh, what, what's going on? And he said to me, you know, I met somebody at a cocktail party and he wrote a book and I think this book would be a great movie. What do you think? And he told me the name of the book. It was called Leona Helmsley, The Queen of Mean. Wow. And I said, yes, what a great idea. And from that moment, by returning that one call where I thought the guy was going to ask me on a date, I ended up making um, quite a bit of money, you know, way over $100,000. So what I will say to everybody is my parting advice, pick up the phone and call people back return their emails, return their texts. You cannot 
you do not know what's in their brains. You, you don't even know what they're thinking about because you're not them. Be curious, be kind, and return everyone's phone calls. That's great, great, great advice from somebody that's been there and done that. And uh, 100 grand, I'm going to go call everybody back tonight. That's <laughs> so, right. <laughs> well, thanks so much, Jane, for taking the time. Very inspiring story how this all came about. And uh, you put yourself out there and you do a good job and uh, you created those relationships and uh, paid back handsomely for it. So thanks so much for coming on. It's my pleasure. Thank you, Tom. All I right. love talking to you always. Well, same here. And everybody else, uh, this has been episode 146. And make sure you go to screwthecommute.com slash 146. That's how you find this specific episode. And like I said, maybe we'll have some links there to Jane's artwork and also uh, uh, links to her site where you, if you're an indie author, you can uh, give it a shot. Or maybe if you're a major publisher, Call your publisher up. Tell her to tell him to, <laughs> tell him to give her some books to, to sell. So uh, or to play. So thanks everybody.